Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I hopefully I'm not stepping on the stones of anyone who has asked an oral question. Um, it's certainly I couldn't even tell you what the oral questions are, Minister. So apologies for that, Minister. Uh, it was indicated I was listening to a very interesting article this morning. There's over 30,000 people now involved in the bonds movement throughout Northern Ireland. And annually, they're receiving approximately 200,000 in funding. Considering that most bonds spend about £20,000 a year on uniforms alone, never mind the equipment that they have to purchase, some of it very expensive, would the Minister not agree that there is room for giving more assistance to that movement? I thank the member for his very topical question. Um, the Funding for the bonds from marching bonds is purely into musical instruments and tuition. There was a public uh, interest test in terms of the felt that by the providing support or monies towards uniforms, you could understand the return in terms of musical tuition, could understand the return in terms of purchasing the instruments. But when it came to uh, the rationale for providing support for uniforms, it didn't stack up as well. Uh, but appreciate the point that the member is making, but I certainly have no plans to introduce funding so bonds can buy uniforms. Certainly happy to continue with the purchasing of instruments, and Ulster Scots uh, do a particularly very good job in terms of tuition, but no plans to provide money for uniforms. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. With, with regard to the issue, obviously, you've researched it on the uniforms. Would the Minister not also agree that the bonds uh, actually are one of the key mechanisms for getting people into the whole area of music and within our culture in Northern Ireland? And whilst you can't give money, as you've clearly pointed out, towards uniforms, could you increase the grant funding towards the actual musical instruments, as they are unfortunately getting more and more expensive. I mean, I appreciate the member's concern in terms of the pressures that some of the marching bands face and keeping up with music, or music and the uniforms and stuff like that, but I have absolutely no uh, intention of increasing the money that is there. In fact, uh, it is not that I have not got an intention to increase the money. There are a bigger demand from bands across, not just marching bands, but bands coming together play pop music, to play traditional music, and I think we need to look at it. But certainly, if there's a demand, an increased demand, and there's evidence for increased demand, and you know, I'm certainly happy to review it, but can't go beyond, beyond that in terms of commitments. Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And following on from my colleague's question, can the minister, does the minister recognise that the, um, the valuable contribution that the marching bands make to the to the cultural expression of the community in Northern Ireland? Uh, I, I do recognise it, and I recognise it for some bands more than others, it's partic and particularly in rural areas, that um, there is a, the, often the band is the hub of the community, and often the skills in terms of musical tuition and musical expertise has been passed on from one generation to another. Uh, so, I mean, that's valued and that's recognised, but uh, you know, does that mean to say there will be additional money for bands? I mean, if there's a bigger demand, not just for marching bands, for, for the pur purchase of musical instruments across the board, I'm happy to look at it, but I haven't seen any particular increase uh, in, in, in requests for support. Uh, and that's not to say they'll probably come flooding in after these two very taboo questions. Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. And it actually, my supplementary ties in again with my colleagues to do with the funding and, and how we encourage the next generation to participate and improve the quality of our marching bands, given that it does teach the young people um, time, routine, and, and, and commitment to, to um, organisations, um, and again, recognising the culture in Northern Ireland. So, would the Minister agree with me in that? in order to encourage our next generation to join our bands, that funding is absolutely necessary? Well, fund, funding is necessary, um, and there's funding awarded through Arts Council, and there's also funding awarded through the Ulster Scots Agency as well. And, and they do an excellent job and have an excellent relationship with a lot of the marching bands, particularly in the Protestant Unionist and Loyalist communities, along with May That Continue. Uh, there's no indication that money will be removed from bands unless bands 
unless they break the law or they break the conditions of their letters of offer and their funding. But that's a case where anybody gets a letter of offer, regardless of what the particular investment was used for in the first place. But needless to say, I'll go back to the point I made to your colleague, if there's an increase, we'll certainly happy to review it, but we can't, I can't personally give a count for additional money. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister if she would commit herself uh, to working with other departments to find a long-term solution to sustain Explorers as a regional here, facility. Here. Here, here. Well, um, I mean, this, certainly I, I recognise that Explorers um, has had a very good campaign in terms of increasing public awareness. Uh, but l l let's be frank about this. We can't have a situation where uh, a current council-run facility that's clearly under threat, there's a decision been made to close it, which has been stayed for two months, uh, and then people claim it's regional, which I'm sure it is, but claim it's regional and then expect the executive to pick it up. Certainly happy to work with colleagues on the issue, but certainly not to commit myself to funding it, because we could have a, a queue coming in here, particularly in, in, in absence, or particularly in, the, in preparation for RPA, of other facilities that we're expected to pick up as well. So, I mean, that's as much as I can say at this stage. Hello. I, I thank the Minister uh, for her response, although I have to say I'm disappointed by it. Can I ask the Minister what impact she thinks losing uh, explorers may have on the provision for leisure activities for our families here or for uh, visitors, tourists coming to Northern Ireland? Um, I have absolutely no idea about the impact, and I think, you know, other than the headlines that we see in the media, we need to see detail, and I think there has been an absence of detail. Uh, certainly, the campaign has been very effective. It has highlighted how people feel about explorers, and I appreciate that, but certainly in terms of even if, and it is a big if, the executive were to support it, there needs to be a lot more detail coming forward other than the headlines, and while I regret that the member is disappointed, any MLA, and particularly any minister worth their salt, isn't going to be gang pressed into an answer because the, the, the members raised the question. Peter Weir. Mr. Weir. Mr. Speaker, uh, can I ask the minister for an update on progress on her discussions with the Irish Football Association in terms of overcoming any difficulties there are with their governance arrangements or articles of association? Well, the discussions are still ongoing, and I'm sure the member will appreciate there's a lot of sensitivity in this. But just to say that I'm confident, I still remain confident, that we can get outstanding issues around governance resolved. Thank the Minister for response. Can I ask the Minister then on the other part of the, the issue uh, of what discussions the Department has had with the European Union to ensure that there isn't any, going to be any blockage to funding from that end of things? Uh, again, we've been in Europe and we'll continue to go in Europe. We're hoping to have an outcome of those, uh, those ongoing discussions before Christmas. But either, either way, it's still, a, it's still a very sensitive issue. It's an issue that I have fought on behalf, particularly on behalf of the IFA, but actually on behalf of the whole executive, because the state aid issue actually questions every investment we've made within the last 10 years, regardless within DECAL, but right across the board. So the member will appreciate and understand that I'm going in uh, and challenging very robustly any claims uh, to Stadia, but needless to say, we're working through it, and we're working through it well. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister if inland waterways can be developed to provide major resource of leisure and recreational activities? Um, I mean, inland waterways do. Uh, they're one of the all-Ireland bodies under my department, and you can see the value, particularly in rural areas, of the work that they do. Certainly, I am working with some of the council areas in terms of improving some of the waterways within their control, but I would agree with the member that they do provide brilliant opportunities, not just for tourism, but for local leisure, uh, and certainly, you know, in some towns and villages, it is the economic driver. Thank you. I thank the, the Minister for her answer. Um, and she just really tread on, on my supplementary, which was to ask the Minister if she would agree that uh, the development of inland waterways, whilst being a great source for leisure and recreational activities, would also act as a catalyst for urban and rural regeneration as well. Yes, I, I would agree. And what, what, I, mean, we made a, I made a statement here, I think it was in July, to the House, particularly on some of the events around inland waterways, obviously across the island, but certainly. 
Uh, some of the events there are festivals, family fun days, but even in terms of huge numbers, which actually do act as an economic driver for people. And not only are they keen to make sure that they're further developed, but other areas are visiting festival or towns and villages through the waterways to see how they can learn to try and extract our product to theirs because they, they see the potential of it and see the outcome of it. Judith Cochran. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, can I ask um, the Minister, um, was she set a deadline for submitting uh, proposals for the Together Building a United Community cross-community sports programme? And if so, has she already submitted proposals? Well, um, I, I ha I'm working with executive colleagues um, on submitting the proposals, not just to the United Building Communities programme, but also to delivering social change on others. And just, you know, because I think the member, I may be wrong, but I, must, I think the member has asked me questions about this before, particularly in relation to disabilities, and I'm still advancing. I'm making disabilities and access to sports for people with disabilities as priority, but there are others there, and we're doing very good work with other, other executive colleagues to have those brought forward. In terms of deadlines, I mean, deadlines do bring a degree of focus, but still there's no point in, you know, Closing or battening the hatches down when we're at a good stage. So, as the member will expect, work has been started, work is progressing, but we're, we're not done yet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, could I um, just ask then, as part of the proposals um, that you have been working on, have you engaged with Ulster Rugby along the way on this? Um, I've engaged, I engage with Ulster Rugby and the other uh, governing bodies on a regular basis. Um, but particularly in terms of this and other projects, uh, the member may remember uh, DECAL uh, invested additional money to rugby, soccer and Gaelic, particularly in terms of promoting equality and, and tackling poverty and social exclusion. And certainly that will be a theme in any proposals that I'll be bringing forward. So those discussions have been ongoing in that vein for some time. Thank you, Mr. Adler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Given that no doubt the Minister supports the principle of transparency and accountability, would she not consider it desirable, if not now essential, that the GAA share with the residents of Moorland and Owen Vara in West Belfast their full business plan in respect to the proposed stadium casement, in order to ensure that the residents know what they might anticipate in the event that, that stadium goes ahead? Yeah, I thank the member for his question, um, and it has been raised before. And I, I went to a meeting um, with the residents, and indeed with his, his uh, brother, his party colleague, uh, at, at the behest of MP for West Belfast, Paul Maskey. Uh, the residents asked me for the full copy of the outline business case, they, uh, and they were advised uh, and accepted that they could have the parts that weren't commercially sensitive. Uh, and they accepted that. So if the member is telling me other ways, uh, I'm happy to meet with them and talk to them about it. Very much the narrative would be different from my point of view, but um, say of the issue of commercial sensitivity, the residents have such a height of concerns around this project that they need to have the fullest possible information in respect to the project. And therefore, uh, noting the commercial sensitivity, even though that's stretching a point, Mr Speaker, in the view of the residents, it's stretching a point when it comes to the issue of commercial sensitivity about the GA business plans. Would you not agree that it is now time and place for the full plan to be released to the residents? Well, I'm glad to see that the member has taken an interest in this. Uh, I do think it's bordering on accusing the GA of misleading the residents when they haven't. The GA has engaged with the residents, as have they engaged with others, and I have engaged with them myself. And it really is rich for anybody to suggest that the, the residents have been kept in the dark. That is not what they're saying to me at all, and I have met them. So I do wonder about the members' motives. Uh, topical questions. We move now on to